out front of that kind of slowing things down a little bit or making it harder for people to get here. But uh, I'm Larry Drake. I'm the chair of the Rocking and Pounding Democrats. And uh, this is another in our Wednesday speaker series. And we're very happy, uh, very lucky today to have Andrew Polinsky as our speaker. Andrew is an attorney. I think uh, he started out as a with legal assistance, right? Uh, public defender. Public, right. Public defender, okay. Um, he, he was the, uh, he played a, a key role in the famous Claremont decision about uh, education funding. He's handled death penalty cases. And uh, <clears throat> last year he was elected to the Executive Council in District 2 which is the gerrymandered, very democratic district that stretches from the border with Vermont to the border with Maine. That's like classic gerrymandering. And uh, on the executive council, uh, Andrew has been active in things like grilling uh, Frank Edelblum, the, uh, who became the education commissioner, uh, unfortunately. But, um, Andrew is here tonight uh, to talk about, uh, I think the talk is titled, Don't Settle for Table Scraps, What New Hampshire Really Needs. Um, and <clears throat> it, there's a rumor out there that he's considering money for, for governor, but you have to ask him about that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's give a warm Rockingham County welcome to Andrew Valencia. District 2 runs Rochester, Dover, to Concord, to Keene, and includes Durham. So you can see how they try to pack as many Democratic strongholds into one district to make the other districts uh, more acceptable to Republican counselors. Um, your district is District 3. Russell Prescott is your executive counselor. Uh, the boundaries of your district were set in a way to counterbalance Portsmouth's influence. So every small Republican town they could fit in, they did to offset Portsmouth. Um, there are five members of the Executive Council. Chris Pappas and I are the two Democrats, so we're in a 3-2 minority. Um, and because we're in that minority, um, Chris and I try to spend some time going around the state to talk in other districts where the councilor is Republican um, to give the Democratic point of view of what the council is about. Um, so let me first start with what the council does and then we can move into my, my uh, attitude adjustment portion of uh, the speech. Uh, so the council has three major responsibilities. Um, the governor's power comes from his ability, or it used to be her ability, to put forward contracts and nominations. So the governor sets our agenda, puts forward contracts. All contracts over $25,000 have to be approved by the executive council, the majority of the executive council. You, you really can't buy light bulbs for a state for less than $25,000. So there's uh, there's a lot that comes forward on our agenda. Um, we vote on the contracts. The governor nominates uh, judges and department heads. Um, they come to hearings before us uh, and we confirm them. So the governor nominates, we confirm. Um, we do uh, agency heads, we've probably done eight hearings on agency heads and another half a dozen on judicial uh, appointees. The um, process, I found, doesn't have any rules. Um, and so once I understood uh, that there were no rules to how confirmation hearings uh, are organized or there are no limits on how many questions you ask, um, it became obvious to me that there was room for a new approach to confirmation hearings. The prior approach had been that if it was your governor's nomination, you voted, 
you voted for the nominee. If it was the other party's nomination, you voted against. You asked a couple of perfunctory questions. You made a little speech, and you cast your vote. Um, I really come to this job with a, a different perspective. Um, I, I think it's important, A, to be prepared, so I read uh, a lot of all the materials that come before us. Um, I've interviewed all the sitting commissioners as a lead-in to the job, so an hour, hour and a half, two hour interviews. Uh, I'll tell you about one of those interviews in a second. Um, and then I think it's my responsibility to be transparent, to bring things out to public. So instead of having an hour or two hour meeting in private with a nominee and then casting my vote, I think it's important to ask the questions in public, and I do. Uh, and as Larry mentioned, I'm a trial lawyer. I'm comfortable at hearings. I like asking questions. Um, and so I do that. Um, the first confirmation hearing I had uh, was of the governor's nomination of Frank Adelblue to be the education commissioner. Uh, Frank Adelblue narrowly lost to Governor Sununu in the Republican gubernatorial primary. A lot of people think that his nomination to become the education commissioner is a payoff for his cooperation uh, with Governor Sununu. I don't know one way or the other, but it certainly looks that way. Uh, Frank Adelblue is completely, completely unqualified to be the education commissioner. He has no background, uh, no academic background, uh, no experience as a teacher or as an administrator, um, no experience with organized schools, whether public or private. <coughs> his seven children were all homeschooled by he and his wife. Um, yeah, all seven. Um, and so, and I, I don't necessarily have a problem with families that choose to homeschool, but you don't come from that <laughs> environment to be the lead professional educator in the state. And in preparing for his confirmation hearing, I found that he was uh, on the board of trustees of a particularly extreme religious institution that required its board members to swear to a biblical worldview, take an oath, and that worldview supports creationism to the exclusion of evolution, considers women second-class citizens because they come from man's rib, and considers, considers any gender identity different than their own as being an abomination. And here this fella was nominated um, to be in charge of the state education program and to interface with the federal government. I mean, there are education bureaucracies at the federal, state, and local level. Frank Gableblue has no experience with any of that. Uh, yet he was uh, offered the education commission, commissioner position. We had an unprecedented hearing. There were uh, seven hours of testimony. Uh, Adelblue probably testified for an hour, hour and a half, and then the majority of people who testified opposed his confirmation. Uh, people from all walks of life, from parents to professional educators, uh, to people who didn't think religion belonged uh, in the public school, people who were afraid for traditional uh, public education. Uh, but Frank Adelblue was confirmed by a 3-2 vote. Your counselor, Russ Prescott, voted for Adelblue. Um, I challenged Adelblue uh, pretty vigorously. Um, and uh, at one point, I asked him, you're going to be the leading educational professional in the state. Um, you've sworn an oath to support creationism to be taught in schools, what about our science standards? Uh, and Frank testified that he's just an implementer, that he wasn't going to set policy, that he was just a good manager and did not want to put his own views in place uh, in the state's education system. Within six weeks of his nomination, uh, he attempted to amend the state's 
science standards, science standards which had been adopted late in 16. They're cutting edge, they're called next gen science standards. They happen to teach evolution as a part of the biology curriculum at appropriate stages throughout the uh, a child's education process. Uh, Frank tried to get them amended and was shut down by the State Board of Education. On the same day that the State Board of Education sent a letter to the legislature opposing what's called SB 193, which is the school voucher bill, Frank Edelblue was on a major radio show in Manchester touting the advan advantages of vouchers, including the ability to spend those vouchers on religious schooling. Um, so I, I found in being on the council uh, that one cannot trust Frank Edelblue, um, and so I pay attention to what he does. Um, and usually when I pay attention and ask a question, I wind up being trolled mercilessly, um, mostly by people who were connected to his campaign. Um, so I get it all the time. And uh, in April of this year, it happened to be I was going to give a speech to the NEA uh, in New London. And before I got in my car, I live in, I live in Concord. Uh, I looked at my phone, and on my phone was a tweet uh, from one of the trolls that said, there's nothing wrong with Frank Edelblue. It's just the hashtag Valinsky agenda. And so I drove to, to New London for this speech, and I thought, you know what? Hashtag Valinsky agenda, I kind of like that. <laughs> so I ripped out a piece of my speech and told the NEA delegates what had happened, and I said, I'll tell you what my agenda is. There's no secret about it. I believe in good schools. I worked on the Claremont education funding suit. I think teachers should be well paid, not have to worry about their retirement. The Valinsky agenda believes that climate change is real and that we need to take climate action now. I think the Valinsky agenda is that access to health care is a basic human right and we all ought to have it. And finally, the hashtag Valinsky agenda is that income inequality is the greatest threat to democracy that we now have. So that's the hashtag Valinsky agenda. I'm proud of it. I'm willing to talk about it anywhere I go. And I used to have a secret weapon uh, in my daughter. She's still my daughter. Um, but she was an art major and co-owned a unionized print shop. So my daughter, Rebecca, made a poster of the Valinsky agenda for me. Um, and it was printed at her print shop. And now my secret weapon has gotten a fellowship to go to earn an MBA, and is no longer my graphic artist. But um, the reason I mention the Valinsky agenda is um, in part because I want you to follow it, but in part, I think there's power in naming what you believe and doing it simply and straightforwardly. Because in part, if you do that, other people with similar, similar beliefs can find you and you can form coalitions. And if we're gonna move from doing good resistance to charting a path forward, we have to work together on this. And so the environmentalists have to support labor and labor has to support the people working on access to health care and the people in health care have to work on the people who are interested work with the people who are interested in education and I think that's how we chart a path forward it's important to me and as we're building the coalitions I think about what is it we're trying to achieve uh, and here's where the table scraps come in I think too often we settle for table scraps and don't look at what's on the table let me give you a couple of examples, but let me give you a point of context first. This legislature passed the second indiscriminate business tax cut. The last legislature did the same thing. This one's going to cost us about $100 million in lost revenues over the biennium. $100 million. I want you to remember that number. Here are the two examples. So the first is we're in the worst opioid crisis in the state's history. It's a big problem. We have on the books um, a statute that says 5% of gross liquor sales 
or it's supposed to go into the drug and alcohol fund. And that fund is used to pay for prevention and treatment and recovery services. Last biennium, it should have been 18 million or so, and the legislature only paid 9 million, 8, 9 million into the fund. So it was underfunded. This biennium, the legislature, the governor's urging, moved that 8 or 9 million up to 11. The amount that should go in because of the statute is 20 million. So instead of getting full funding in a time of crisis, we got a little bit more. And as a result, all of the advocates in the area who practice in trying to protect and advance policy interests around drug abuse and addiction are screaming the advantages of a small increase and not talking about the fact that we haven't fully funded the drug and alcohol fund during a time of crisis. So the shortfall in drug and alcohol funding is going to be about $10 million this biennium. How much was that business tax cut? <laughs> so where did that $10 million go? It went to pay for that business tax cut. The business tax cut, by the way, is going to be enjoyed by the largest corporations in the state. 80% of it goes to the Walmarts, BAEs, the largest companies. It doesn't go to help the mom and pop businesses. So that's one example. The second example is full day kindergarten that's being funded by Keno Gambling. Keno Gambling is the worst form of public gambling. You sit in a bar, you drink beer, and you bet on random numbers every couple of minutes. That's what Keno is. And the proceeds of that are supposed to produce six, eight, ten million dollars, depending on who you ask about it, and that's going to be committed, supposedly, to fund full-day kindergarten. Now, there's no question how important full-day <coughs> kindergarten is. All of the research is pretty clear on that. And because there's such support for full-day kindergarten, the Speaker of the House knew he couldn't oppose it. So what he did as a poison pill was to say, you can have full-day funding, a uh, full day kindergarten, but we're going to fund it with Keno gambling. And he thought no one would swallow that. So our people on our side didn't feel that they could go back to their communities and say they turned down any opportunity for money. And so they voted for Keno gambling funded kindergarten. That's resulted in some wonderful photo ops for the governor where he and Democratic leaders are mugging for the camera with a bunch of little kids in the photo saying Governor Sununu got us fully funded full day kindergarten when that is not accurate. The problem is to explain it is complicated and we've given him these great color glossy photos and we've settled for table scraps. So the shortfall in funding for kindergarten is six, eight, ten million dollars. How much was that business tax cut? Hundred million dollars. So where did the children's kindergarten funding go? To the business tax cut. So not only do I think we need to build coalitions to chart a path forward, but I also think we need to keep our eye on the ball. We need to understand the implications of our settling for less, our taking table scraps. And, and be clear on what we believe in. Be willing to say, this isn't good enough for name your population, for the people who need drug abuse treatment, for the children who need kindergarten. We can do a lot better. Um, and in a state that underfunds many of these services, the idea that we give a hundred million away in a business tax cut when we need these services funded uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. And at the very least, we should not be lauding the Republican leadership for doing that. So let me let me end there. Uh, Larry asked that uh, I leave time for questions. I'm happy to 
answer questions. I'm happy to hear your comments on any of this. Um, and let's let's see where we go. Okay, so let me um, we'll take a little break. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. And we're going to pass the hat. Hat to them. Can you uh, pass the hat? We're, we have to pay for her. And um, she's she's actually meeting right now as we as we meet over at our office on, on Exeter Road with Exeter Rises, which is the local indivisible group. And uh, so Carrie's working hard. She's been endorsed by the AFL-CIO and by the uh, AFT. And um, her, her opponent is a guy named Jim Head from, from Auburn, who was in the legislature before. He voted for this terrible O'Brien budget back in 2011. He's big on right to work, and he's backed by the Americans for Prosperity, which is the Koch brothers and the local free staters. There's at least one state rep in that area who's a free state. And so um, we're working on that. So, so here's the announcement. That is on Tuesday, September 26th, at our office at 104 Epping Road, from 9 o'clock on in the morning, we're going to be doing a phone bank. We're going to call all the Democrats in the district to remind them to get out and vote. And so I'm encouraging everybody to, you know, if you can stop by for an hour and make some calls, just bring a charged up cell phone. We'll have the list. And uh, just want to say, I think we've got a chance. Just yesterday, okay, there was a state rep, a special state rep election in Laconia, and the Democrat, Charlie St. Clair, won. Laconia is pretty Republican. He, Charlie St. Clair won by 10 percentage points. This is the same district that voted, that went for Trump by 17 percentage points, okay? So we're seeing these incredible shifts. And Carrie's from Chester, I've, I've done, done the library research. There's only been one Democrat elected state rep from Chester in the last 100 years. That was, that was Charlotte Lister back in 2006. But um, I think, if, you know, Carrie's got a real chance. And so if you can, you know, spend a little time on Tuesday the 26th at our office making some get out the vote calls, that would be great. Okay, any, any other announcements or anything? Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew for the Q&A and uh, let her rip. Anyone remember their questions? <laughs> um, let's, let's just go this way. Go ahead. The agenda of the, of the Governor's Council is primarily or exclusively sent by the Governor's Office, I mean the, all the items. Is there any opportunity, uh, pre presumably they would have to, well, without going, is there any opportunity for you and or um, Chris to raise questions, uh, to say we'd like to, we'd like to interview so-and-so, again, you know, a confirmed official. Is there any opportunity to kind of bring things out? Yeah, so the governor decides the official pieces of the agenda, what contracts, which nominations. But then once a contract is on the agenda, each of the counselors can ask whatever questions they want about it. And so some of that questioning is directed to the contract itself. Some of it's directed to the commissioner's activities. So some of you may know Commissioner Edelblu has continued to keep a full political palette um, going. So he's speaking with the O'Brien group. I think it's tonight, as a matter of fact. Um, he was the keynote speaker for the Liberty Alliance. And so when a an education department contract came up a couple of meetings ago, I took the opportunity to ask why he's breaking precedent with every other education commissioner before him and maintaining this partisan political uh, approach. Um, and he didn't really have a good answer. Uh, Sununu said everyone does it, and that's simply not true. I mean, I, I don't mind, I like the governor, but I don't mind disagreeing with him, but he's not entitled to create his own facts. And the truth is, education commissioners have avoided political appearances during their terms. 
So we have that opportunity. Good. Thank you. Herb, and then here. If there's a change. Yeah. Oh. oh. Um, Let's go here first. You have uh, mentioned a couple of um, examples of breach of what are apparently uh, state regulations, state laws. What what recourse is there? No organization to challenge this to, <coughs> to court to, to take it to court. The to issue. Take. Well, you mentioned several things that were codified into law, and then they did the reverse or whatever they wanted. Uh, aren't there ways to address those things in the in the legal system? Well, I, some of it is some of it can be addressed in the legal system. Um, as the Claremont lawyer, I, I know what that takes. Yeah. You know, we were in court for 10 years uh, without getting paid. Um, I did a six-week trial uh, against the state of New Hampshire, um, which is really hard to pull off without any funds. Sure. Um, so the legal avenue isn't always the best. Um, I think Chris Pappas and I agree that making things public uh, making the record clear, um, understanding what's happening, and make sure making sure everyone else understands uh, gives you an opportunity to make a political uh, response possible. So one of the things I do in that regard is after every council meeting, I write a council report uh, about things that don't show up in our votes. So we had a dis we had a vote on a contract about. Uh, the computer systems for auto inspections. It's a yay or nay vote. Doesn't mean a lot to people, but during the, co the conversation about the contract, Wheeler and Kenny both said they don't believe in the Clean Air Act <laughs> and they'd like to see it removed in the state of New Hampshire. And so my council report reflected that part of the conversation, which you would never find. You'd have to listen to hours and hours of really boring tapes. So if anyone wants to be on the list to receive the council reports, send me an email. It's andrewvolinsky at gmail, A-N-D-R-U-V-O-L-I-N-S-K-Y at gmail. And I'll put you on the list. And usually a few days or a week after each council meeting, you'll get a two or three page electronic report that documents these kinds of things. So that's in part what I'm trying to do. And I'm trying to raise issues that aren't raised otherwise. So at every council meeting, when we approve a contract for a state vendor, I ask the commissioners how much the vendor pays its lowest paid employee. Because I want to know if we are giving state money, your money, my money, to a vendor who pays starvation wages. And after doing that, meeting after meeting, probably three or four months in, the union leader reporter realized I was doing it and asked about it. And it resulted in a, a significant story by Dave Solomon uh, and will result in legislation being submitted to adopt kind of a prevailing wage statute for the state. Um, so one thing leads to another, and you try and set it up in small ways, and hopefully it comes together. Sir? If there's a change in governor in 2018, will the new governor be able to uh, recommend or appoint a new commissioner of education? No. The commissioners are appointed for terms of four years. And the governors run for terms of two years, as do the counselors. So whoever the next governor is in 18 may be stuck with Frank Edelblum. And it's, it's very difficult to remove a commissioner who's not done with his or her term. You have to essentially impeach them, uh, which isn't going to happen. The, the second question, Massachusetts has very supportive legislation for solar. Yeah. New Hampshire has been fairly conservative on it. Is yes. there any activities or actions going on to try to improve um, the implementation of solar for domestic use? Yeah. Um, Domestic and, and commercial is the subject of discussions. The problem is we don't have the votes in the legislature. And the governor is opposed. So the governor doesn't support incentives. And so um, I know, for example, the incentive for commercial solar 
um, would pay 60 cents a watt for installations. That's been used up for the year. So the fiscal year starts July 1. We're six weeks into it. The incentive program's gone. And it's not clear that it's going to come back uh, unless the complexion of the legislature changes dramatically. Is, is the complexion of the legislature, are they climate deniers? Or do they believe in climate change? Is there, are there climate deniers within New Hampshire? The uh, governor's brother, Michael, is one of the most prolific climate denier authors uh, in the country. Um, if you want to read some of his work, just go to the Josiah Bartlett Center website uh, and you'll read some of the most ridiculous anti-science trash that you can imagine. But yeah, so they're there. It, it, I don't know how widespread it is, but I, I do know there are a significant number of climate change deniers. And there's certainly, uh, in the Republican Party, there's not a lot of support for spending money to deal with climate change. So even if they're not deniers, we're, we're limited by our intentional efforts not to take any revenue. Uh, yeah? Serving in the legislature, we're given the challenge of finding the money to fund things, because we don't have enough money. It's referred to the business tax cuts and, and give the money away. Uh, I found a nice little spot where there was some money uh, that I would could report to the school building aid program, which is probably that was on the moratorium. Yeah. Uh, rooms and meals tax is 9% in the Hampshire. It's a little high, but the people pay it. And then the operator gets to keep 3% retainer before he sends his money in. Now, most people don't know. You didn't know that, did you, Larry? So it's a nice little perk for the, for the uh, operator. So that's about $10 million a year. That could, do, that could do kindergarten, that could help with building aid, and uh, that didn't pass. Right. So, you know, Larry commented about the governor's race. I think we need to be looking across the board. We need to change the complexion of the legislature. We need to find a, a third counselor uh, who's willing to join Chris Pappas and me. Um, it needs to be across the board. It, it's the difficult, what Larry mentioned the special election. We've done pretty well in special elections. And it's only by doing the careful block and tackling of making calls, of getting out, of finding good candidates that we can make that difference. And, and we need to keep doing it. And, and the Senate as well. Yes. Absolutely. Just doing the House without the Senate. Yes, absolutely. Did you have a question? Um, I did have a question. You missed the first one about where we find news of the Executive Council. And I'll be sure to get your, um, send you my email so I get yours. Um, but the other question was the $100 million um, um, business cut. tax cut. Yeah. Was that part of a budget or a special bill, the budget or a special bill, or what bill number was it, if it oh, was a bill? I don't remember the bill number. It was a separate bill that reduced the rate imposed for the BET to the BPT. And um, I'd just like to verify that our Republican representatives that we're trying to oust, we formed a Southampton Democratic Committee just to work to try to bring Democrats yep. into the House, but I'd like to just track their votes on, on that particular bill. When, when was it brought? Probably the easiest way to find the bill number is to go to the DRA website, and they have some explanatory pieces there about the last one and the current one. Uh -huh. And I think in that narrative, you'll find the bill number. Okay. Andrew, for those who don't know, what is DRA? DRA is the Department of Revenue Administration. It's the tax agency in New Hampshire. Yeah? So I think I got your point about shooting someone and then offering a band-aid and really celebrates the generosity of the band-aid. Yes. But in making that, you were talking about um, uh, funding uh, efforts to uh, combat the opiate crisis. What evidence is there that, in fact, any of the 
efforts to combat the opiate crisis are in fact effective? I, I, so the efficacy of the efforts to combat the opioid crisis depends on the modality that you're talking about. So there are prevention, there are treatment, and then there are recovery efforts in three broad buckets. So you have to look at the modalities within each. Um, happen to know in the prevention side um, that the old DARE programs, the Scare em Straight, were fairly useless. Um, and that uh, there's a lot of research going on about being honest with middle and high school kids to teach them about the dangers of drug abuse in a rational way and that that's more effective. Um, so I know the Hilton Foundation is doing that. The only reason I know this is my daughter is a social worker in a high school in Harlem and she's part of a project working on this. Um, but you have to study it one by one um, and I, I don't have each one at my fingertips. So when you discuss with Republican opposition uh, why they don't want to fund programs like this. Um, what do they say? Um, it's, it's mostly a matter of we don't have the money. And so they start at the end of the conversation rather than being willing to talk about how we got to the point. I mean, in the school funding area, for example, I know my counterparts in the 35 other states, all right? My friends in Mississippi, even if they won their lawsuit, couldn't accomplish anything because there are no resources available, no matter how you try. We're not Mississippi. We're the seventh wealthiest state in the nation. We have resources. This is intentional on our part. We're deciding to starve government because we don't believe in its purpose, is what some of my Republican colleagues are doing. And once we have that conversation, then we can talk about, is this really in everyone's interest? But if we only have the conversation at the end, there's no money, therefore we can't do this one, we can only do this one, and we can only do this one a little bit, you can never get out of that cycle. We put another hundred million in the rainy day fund, although it's been raining in the state. Right, so the people know what the rainy day fund is. It's, it's a surplus fund. Um, it's like a net capital fund that the state keeps. And, and it is really well funded, um, which means it can't be used for other purposes without legislative direction to do that. And the current legislature won't release those funds for name it, school funding, for opioid funding, for kindergarten, for workforce development. You know, our, our governor went to 100 businesses to beg them to move to New Hampshire. It, it's not for lack of asking that businesses haven't moved here. The bottleneck is we don't have enough well-trained employees available. And related to that, we don't have enough workforce housing for regular working people because it's too expensive. And so if we don't address those issues, we can't improve the climate for business here. I'm not anti-business. I'm a business lawyer. I do commercial litigation, so I work with businesses all the time. I actually surprised Russ Prescott because I can read a balance sheet. Go figure. Um, but it's, it's really having a view towards what businesses need rather than making it about me or making it about Chris Sununu asking businesses to move here. There are certain components that you need to run a business, and one of the major ones is good employees, and, and we're slim in that regard. Last one? Is it, uh, is it just the governor's decision when the council meets in places other than Concord? Uh, so that's a, 
a tradition um, in the summer and the fall. We go on the road and each of the counselors takes a turn. So we each designate a location in district. So this morning, Chris Pappas was up and he arranged for us to have breakfast at the Boys and Girls Club in Manchester. And then our meeting was at the New Hampshire Food Bank. Uh, great locations. This is Hunger Action Month. So being at the food bank was a really appropriate, good place to be. Uh, Keene State is in my district. Keene State needs some attention. And so I had the last meeting and I arranged for us to do it in the advanced manufacturing wing of the design building at Keene State. Um, and it was well received. So we take it on the road. I think uh, Dave Wheeler's up next. He's, he's having us have breakfast at the Anheuser-Busch factory. So I, I'm a little worried about what breakfast will be. Uh, but then the meeting is at the Merrimack Town Hall, a very appropriate site. Yeah. Um, federal government has been on this traveling road show on border suppression, which came to New Hampshire this week. Do you have any, any uh, comments on that? Or knowledge as to what, what the upshot of it was? Um, I'm not sure what the upshot of it was. I know it happened yesterday and there was a lot of attention paid to it. I don't know what it's meant to accomplish. I'm a little suspicious of its goals, more than a little suspicious. I think it's uh, an effort to suppress voters that don't agree with the people who set up the commission. Um, but it's, it's ongoing. Um, we had in New Hampshire um, a legislative effort to make it harder to vote. It's called SB3, and that was in court on Monday. And on Tuesday morning, the judge uh, found the penalties. You could, you could be fined $5,000, or you could face a misdemeanor for not having your paperwork in within a certain period of time, and the judge nullified those penalties and he's promised to look at the rest of the law that makes it harder to register to vote um, by late October. So uh, stay tuned. Yeah. This may be as much for Larry as for you, but this morning driving to work on NPR, I heard Chris Kobach, who's the Secretary of State of Kansas, yeah. talking about how we'll never know about New Hampshire and whether it was a fair election. And uh, another story about the, uh, the pardoning of the sheriff of Maricopa County, Arizona, uh, Joe Arpaio. Uh, I didn't hear any Democrat interview. Why is that? I don't know. Uh, to be honest, um, I, I, uh, I've been on NHPR a number of times as well as a number of other um, media outlets. Um, I don't understand why there's not balance in that. And I also don't understand why we're timid in our response to those things. I, I mean, the pardon of Joe Arpaio is an affront to all of us. And, and we should be willing to say that. Uh, it's not a state issue, it's a federal issue. So I, I try to focus on the state issues because we get lost at times in the scheme of things. But we shouldn't be timid. I mean, that's the point of not limiting ourselves to table scraps. I think we're too timid uh, sometimes in our approach to things. But I, I do want to say, I don't know why, I can't speak to NHPR's, you know, why the reporters do things or, or, or don't do things. But the New Hampshire Democratic Party was very, uh, it was out there yesterday. I mean, there was a demonstration near St. Anselm's against this, that, that the party was involved in. You know, we've been tweeting things. Gene Shaheen and, and Maggie Hassan have come out with, a, I think, a pretty strong statement, pretty much urging um, Secretary of State Bill Gardner to, to, to step down from this commission. He's on it. So, I, I mean, I think the, the, the party's doing what we, what we can, you know, but we don't control it. How about one last question? Do you, um, in terms of Governor Sununu presenting you with these various things that you have to review and consider, 
do you, do you get much in the way of public input? Are people looking at that? Um, so we get a hundred item agenda on Friday and then have to vote on it on Wednesday. So often those five days, including the weekend, that's our time frame. So to the extent I know an issue's coming, complicated issue, Medicaid funding, um, things of that nature, I reach out to people. But the agendas go online Friday afternoons on the Secretary of State site. People should look at it. If they have interest, email me. I'm happy to, to get more information. There have been over the last nine months, and also during the election, there's a cadre of people that I've run into that have expertise different than my own, and so I proactively reach out and I see an agenda item that I don't understand, um, and that's been really helpful to me. And then I can, because I point them, or I confirm them, the commissioners take my calls. So when there's something in a contract that I can't follow, I call and they'll put me in touch with the point person on a project and I can ask them questions. I tend to repeat a lot of those questions in the hearings because I, I want the public to know, but they'll usually help me understand what they're doing. Are your sessions um, televised? No. They, they are recorded mm -hmm. and then the Secretary of State puts them online. And if you still use Internet Explorer, you can download them. But you have to have Internet Explorer to do that. So it's a real shortcoming in the system. Okay. Any, any, any more questions? So, Andrew, what about the, the, the run for the governor? Where, 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 where do we stand? <laughs> I want to hear what people think I should do rather than offering because I quite frankly I'm, I'm wrestling with the decision do I give up the council seat that I have where I'm in a lot of ways changing the way we do business uh, in order to take a shot at a first term governor. Uh, there are a lot of policy reasons where I disagree with the governor, there are policies that I would like to advance. Um, I've been paying attention. I do have, I'm a mature adult. I, I understand what I believe in. Um, and so those things make me think of running. I've gotten a lot of encouragement. But I am weighing the idea that um, I could use more time on the council. I, I don't hesitate to admit that. Um, and I'm the only lawyer on the council. Uh, and I happen to be a trial lawyer, so I'm comfortable asking tough questions in a hearing setting. And I'm a, a little reluctant to give that up. So I, I would love to hear people's thoughts, not in a big setting like this, but feel free to reach out to me over the next couple of weeks uh, and share your thoughts. Um, there are a number of good people considering the race. Uh, I'm happy that exists. The one point I'll make is there isn't a U.S. Senate seat open this time. So whoever is running for governor is at the top of the ticket. And one of my concerns is if we don't have a strong gubernatorial candidate, the rest of the ticket suffers. And so we have to be careful about that. We're going to make some gains. So there are a number of, of considerations to balance. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. And this is That's for you. All yes. right. Great. Thank you. All right. All right. So everybody swim across the street here with a broken mane. And uh, be careful. Yes.